Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for coming along to this session, which hopefully will provide you with some answers as to how to get really good and really high-rating documentaries. Um, when I ran BBC One, I used to say, I want to be good and I want to be popular. And I think that could also be a maxim for this session. And we've got four brilliant experts with us on the stage, I'm glad to say. Um, they've between them been responsible for some of the UK's highest rating shows and uh, also they're going to put those shows and others under the microscope as we try to come up with the anatomy of a big hit. So what are the common themes? Does volume come at the cost of innovation or is it all in the execution or is it all in the subject matter or is it just down to scheduling and luck? Um, with me on the stage I've got Leanne, who the hell does she think she is, Klein, um, Chief Executive of Wall to Wall. Um, Leanne is an extremely experienced executive producer of a whole range of factual programs, not just Who Do You Think You Are and Long Lost Family, um, but also entertainment shows like The Voice and dramas like The Girl. Um, Alex, every time I look at him, I think I've got Mick Jagger on stage with me. I thought I might as well put that out now. Um, put that out there now, because you're probably all thinking that. Alex Gardner's Managing Director of ITV's Factual Arm Shiver. Um, he's worked on a range of shows from uh, Piers Morgan's Life Stories to Paul O'Grady's Life of Dogs. And and the sensational documentary that has, is still having ramifications today, Exposure, The Other Side of Jimmy Savile. He's also executive produced I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Um, so again, another person with a lot of entertainment experience. Third is Andy McKenzie, um, Chief Creative Officer of 2.4 and one of my wonderful colleagues. Um, he is responsible for a range of programming, including um, you know, the um, wonderful Educating Essex and Educating Yorkshire. And he's also done a lot of entertainment, uh, including The Jump and Splash more recently. And he's seen life from the other side of the table too, when he was a commissioner at Channel 4. And he was, I believe, the first person to commission my big fat gypsy wedding, I think as a single at the time. Stuart Cab, he is uh, managing director of Plum Pictures, has done everything from James May's Toy Stories through to Rachel Koo's Little Paris Kitchens and ratings blockbuster um, Inside Death Row with Trevor McDonald. So as you can see, we've got um, a wide range of expertise here and they're going to share their tips with you. Um, but we're going to start by looking at what are some of the programmes that have hit that five million mark and more over the past few years. For so many millions of people, I'm here wearing my heart on my sleeve. From Benefit Street. I stand on bullshit no longer. I'm leaving. Love is just like a flower. At the end, all falls off and dies. To Buckingham Palace. Her Majesty will have a Jean and Dubonnet. How are supposed to be enjoying this <laughs> It is theatre, there's no doubt about it. From serving toffs. You will be the wind beneath the guest's wings. If anything goes wrong, you are not looking for a job. Plus me, by the way. To serving time. We've got lads here that are, doing, are 20 years old that are on their fifth sentence. Welcome to hell. From one exotic culture. Oh, yes, very good. I so easily could have been that sardine. To another. I wasn't expecting this, Jesus Christ. It's like a royal wedding. From the high street, then. To the high street, now. Uh, the question I get asked mostly in here, how much is this? That is the truth. <laughs> From childhood tales. <laughs> it's like, that's all there is to me. To puppy dog tales. We've got the results back. From oh, me. don't tell me. It's really good news, yeah? From the warmest of families. All of a sudden, we had six babies. There's no manual to tell you how to do these things. To the coldest of families. They accept the spy cam as one of their own, even testing its reaction. From ultimate loss. This is beyond the scope of our experience. This is much worse, and we're not going to have a plan for this. To being found. She's going to be overjoyed. Your daughter has been found. 
All these found five million. It's terrifying. You can only do your best. Oh, that's fantastic. What's next? So that's it, now we go to a fight now, and a couple of fights, that's it. So looking at those clips, um, before we go into the, your own clips that you've brought, can you see anything, any themes that come out that maybe contribute to getting five million? Um, I think emotion is a big one. Like they all tell a story that, make, that move you. And I think, I think people, uh, when you make a decision to sit down and, and, and watch telly, uh, which is what kind of we all try and imagine when you come up with an idea, um, you people want to be want to be moved in a way, don't they? And they want to feel that telly, in some way, is going to make them better. Uh, whether that's you know any, the old public service values of educate, entertain, and inform, or or just simply to entertain. And I think they all promise some level of movement and emotion that is going to give you uh, a good night in in that all important hour that you probably put into telly every night. And I, I also would add to that conclusion. They really are trying to be open and reach out to the audience and draw them in, rather than in any way shut out part of the audience and say this isn't for you. There's a sort of they're quite demographic in a way in that they want to appeal and as be as engaging as possible to as wide a range as possible. So therefore, I think they're not programmes where there's an element of lecturing to the audience or looking down at the audience. It's very much engaging with them on their emotional level. Leanne, anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that sub the subject matter has to unite us in some way. To get, I mean, to get five million viewers, you're basically that's ten percent of the population are watching, and that's a you know that's a huge number. And so it has to be subject matter that somehow will engage with lots of people. And there aren't that many subjects that will do that. Um, so I think. There can be brilliantly made programmes that are emotional and all those things, but unless they have that broad appeal, then never you're not going to get five million viewers. They also need to be amazingly made, the storytelling, the craft in them, but they need to have a proposition up front that enough people will be interested in. Um, and so there are themes there, you know, dogs and, and the royal family, and family and identity and broad themes, but they do need to be broad for us to want to, enough of us to want to go and watch it. Mm. Stuart? I, think, um, I mean, I would add to that, uh, I mean, familiarity and rarity, sort of familiar that we understand the story immediately, um, requires no thought, you can sort of see what the story uh, matter might be, but familiarity and the rarity of the approach, it, it promises something special that isn't common, that in some way the access is different or there's a presenter doing something you weren't expecting and he or she suffers or experiences something that you're not used to them seeing. And then um, I suppose the final point would be marketing. I think all of those shows uh, had public awareness that they were trowed well by the networks, that there was a good press campaign. In some way, they had a conversation with the audience that people thought that this was not the common fare on television um, and that it was worth watching and that it felt something more than it would be normally in the TV marketplace. And it delivered on that. When you watched it, you felt like you were seeing something that had a rarity about it. So I would say all of those things, and there's no common formula, but there are certainly common hit points, aren't there? So each of the panellists has brought along a clip from one of their shows that got high ratings and they're going to show you the clip and then tell you a little bit about why they think that particular show shone through. So Leanne, I think you're going to start with a clip from Long Lost Family. Uh, yeah, I am. So um, before we roll it, I'll just, if, for those of you who haven't seen um, Long Lost Family, I'll tell you a bit about it. Um, it's a series we've been making for ITV Factual for about four years now. In fact, Series 4 is about to um, go on air. And it's a very, very simple premise and proposition, which is there are thousands of people in the UK who want to find a close relative that they either have never met or haven't seen for decades. So uh, mothers, fathers, uh, sons, daughters who are desperate to find someone. And th the, the show finds that person for them and reunites them on camera. Um, and uh, the s clip I'm going to show was from actually last year's series. It was the opening episode. Uh, and it got something like 6.4 million which as, over, as an overnight, which was extraordinary and even to us very surprising. 
Um, but I think there are a number of reasons why the show has become just such a huge hit. Um, but should we just run it first? It's about um, this particular story is a fireman who came to us in his 40s looking for his mum. And uh, he was desperate to find his mother. And when we found her, we discovered that not that she was still married to his father. They'd given him up when they were 16, having got pregnant very young, and then um, had stayed together. And there was this whole dark story in this family. Anyway, we've reuni we reunited them all, and it was quite exceptional even for us making it. Uh, but here's a clip of the, the son and mother meeting for the first time. Love you. Yeah, hope so. It will all be good. So just keep walking up there and they're in the cafe. Okay. I've seen you. Yeah. Oh, you look oh. wonderful. Oh, that's lovely for you to say. It's nice cuddling you. Oh, dear. You don't have to apologise for nothing whatsoever. So. Why'd you pick that? Huh? Why'd you pick that clip? <laughs> it, to be honest, I, it was just pick so something from a. It? Yeah. I was going um, to say, this might be a Sheffield documentary first where the chair actually cries at the first clip. Mm -hmm. To be honest, it's I mean, hard so to pick. It's, it's, it's interesting because it's a hard series to show little clips from. Yeah. Like, we try and cut the pre-title every year and it's really hard because actually you've just got to let it play. Uh, but then once you play it at any length, it just makes you cry, basically. And in fact, on the train up here this morning, I was watching the first episode of the next series and it was quite a busy train and I was just sobbing. And... Um, I've become this barometer where basically I, I don't watch cuts very early anymore, but I, I'm the sort of last sort of firewall before they go out to ITV, and, and I, I have to cry a certain number of times to know that it's actually working, and if I don't, we get worried. So, um, I mean, um, you know, in many ways it's obvious why this is such a popular programme, but I, I think that there's something about the way that the story has been handled in Long Lost Family that I think particularly works. And it's interesting, because I was thinking Andy knows this, because when he was at Channel 4, we were talking about this territory uh, a lot and actually developing it with you, weren't we? I can afford it. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we were, it was interesting, because we were saying, look, you know, it, it, I think probably as um, factual programme makers out there, you know there are lots and lots of people who... The story of this country, actually, is that 40 years ago, so many people had to give away babies because of the moral climate at the time. If you were 16 or 17 or 18, not married, and you got pregnant and there was no contraception, you would basically have to give your baby up. So there are thousands and thousands of adopted people in, in Britain. And for a long time, they've been reuniting or trying to reunite with their birth parents. So we knew there was something there. But the way of telling it was, was difficult, partly because, you know, it's an incredibly intense, uh, you know, once-in-a-lifetime moment for people. And the privilege of actually letting cameras into that moment, you know, was something that we could never work out how to achieve that, really. Uh, and that was the big challenge of making it. Um, but I think what we came to was a show which just went completely for the emotion, rather than we talked about the process and following someone, you know, who was the searcher who did the process. And in the end, it is just about that burning desire, which is quite unlike any other human desire. And yet we can all relate to it, even though we're not adopted or we haven't never met our dad or whatever, because we've we've got a mother or we, we've got a father or we've got children, we can completely relate to what it would be like not to have those things. 
and the emotional impact of meeting someone after all that time. So actually, we just went with that. And there's quite a clear format, actually, in the series, even though it's not, it hasn't got format beats and points, you know, and sort of contrivances. But essentially, there are a number of scenes we film on the way to a reunion, and each one of those has a level of revelation in it that means you just keep watching. It's an unfolding narrative. And I think that's a really important thing for popular programs. It's quite difficult to have something that isn't a sort of forward-going story, isn't it? You need a story to take people through it, need, you know, to stick with something. Um, so I think that's one of the things that really counts. And the authenticity of it, the privilegedness. I mean, what, what Stuart was saying about the rarity, it is a privilege to be at those reunions. And what we had to learn to do was stand back from them and not be too intrusive so that you didn't feel sort of voyeuristic and a bit grubby watching it. But essentially, that is an ex exceptional moment for the people there. So it, comes, it just comes through the screen, doesn't it? Um, and I think the big thing about Long Lost Family is it elevates very ordinary people into something extraordinary because their lives are extraordinary. And it's interesting because uh, it's always been scheduled after Coronation Street on ITV. And it is essentially a soap opera, a real life soap opera, and it's a soap opera audience that it inherits. And I think that's a lot to do with its success. So that's it, really. Can I ask one question? Yeah. Is it as popular in other countries is it is in Britain? Um, it's only just being made this way in other countries. So it was a it was a format in Holland. Well, it's been going in Holland for 20 years, but it's a completely different show. And so we changed it dramatically from that. And now we consult to all the different countries that are now buying the format because they make it the way we do. So I, the answer is I don't know yet. Um, One thing that's quite interesting is that you've got presenters in it, mm. Nikki and um, Davina, and you know Davina's used in that particular clip, for example. She was more of a protagonist than a yeah. presenter. They, I mean, the, the other thing to say is that it, it is a format, but because it's something that happens in real life anyway, they, we decided to make them the agents of the search in a way. So they're... The, we work with people behind the scenes who are kind of qualified mediators and social workers, and essentially Nikki and Davina do that job on screen. So they do they do the search and they do the mediating between the people, and that so that they're not really presenters at all. Um, they're just the voice of the production, really. And do you, do you have a really high attrition rate in terms of the number of yeah. journeys you start but don't finish? Well. I'm probably giving away lots of secrets here, but we, re we rarely start, a stor start filming a story we don't finish, but we um, probably reunite ten times as many people off camera as we do on camera, if you see what I mean. So we, we launch a lot of stories, but not all of them are filmable. Um, and we, pr we probably consent and you know, research and psych 120 people a year for 16 stories. OK, so now for something completely different. Alex mm -hmm. is going to show us a clip of For the Love of Dogs with Paul O'Grady, uh, another ratings blockbuster, isn't it? Uh, it? Yes, it's been very good to us. It gets about 6 million uh, viewers in the last uh, outing on ITV last year. Um, on a lower budget, but I don't think that that should in any way stifle the ambition. Um, and. I think obviously there are two key elements to it. Dogs, which um, in this nation seem to be universally loved, and Paul O'Grady. And it really started by us just realising that Bassey Dogs Home was 100 years old, what do we do about it? And our original ideas, I think, were your very traditional, you know, obstock at the dog's home or something like that. But then just seeing the way Paul O'Grady on his chat show um, his dogs were almost more interesting and his relationship with his dogs were almost more interesting than the guests that he was talking to. He was a man that really feels like, A, there's a real genuine, genuine passion towards um, dogs, but animals in general. But B, he sort of sees them and relates to them in a slightly different way, I think, to many other people. You know, he is a modern-day Dr. Doolittle. He genuinely does... Um, transpose characteristics and personalities onto these animals that he really believes, brings to life and engages with. Um, and so we just thought that this real genuine passion, but with 
a slightly different relationship with dogs and dogs together would be a winning combination. Um, but I think there's a lot of cynicism around popular programmes where people just think, oh yeah, cute dogs, famous presenter, put them together, bang, hit. And I just think that that undermines and downplays actually a lot of the effort that goes into how you tell the stories. Because one thing that I think, one reason I think it punched through was obviously that magic relationship between the two. But also, it wasn't just, oh, two popular areas, let's do it as it's always been done. It wasn't Animal Hospital. It wasn't like some of the other series that have followed in its path where it is treating it much more as a straight doc. Um, you know, there's deliberately a you know, sort of 1940s nostalgic soundtrack. There's slow-mos of the dogs, so you really get to see their sort of enthusiasm and their sort of puppy dog eagerness. You know, there's comedy moments amongst the doc that are clearly scripted and the running gags that run throughout the series. So there's a lot more to it than just bringing presenter and animal together. But I think one thing that's common with quite a lot of the 5 million plus programmes is that presenters also do give you a level of access um, to the emotional heart of stories that then really help you engage with a much, much broader audience, I think. And this is a classic example with Paula Grady. I should, for a laugh's sake, have chosen a funny clip from the series, but instead I chose an emotional clip. And I think it's because you identify with Paul and his passion for dogs, it just makes this scene, for me, which is quite a sort of typical scene rather than an exceptional scene in the series, but it just is an example of how um, it helps you with your emotional engagement. So, cue the clip, Drew. There's another question I don't want to ask. When's it going to happen? I think for me, the thing is, he's not in discomfort at the yeah. moment. And we do have a sort of this potential home as well, a lovely lady who's really? seen him when she's coming, she's come down here to get another dog and she's seen him and um, fell in obviously, love. Yeah, yeah, obviously fallen in love with him. And, so uh, she's prepared to take him on, yeah, what an old. Yeah, so you know if he spends a summer tootling around the back garden, that's then that's, lovely all, for that's him. all great yeah. for us, you know. At least Frankie won't spend the time he has left in kennels. It's a very small consolation though. He's such a sweet, I'm gonna have to go nice and him. <laughs> Oh, I can't bear it. I'll have to go, Sean. This dreadful was come over me. We get these cases here, don't we? I'm only good at this, but not with him. It's bad to see, isn't it? Oh, God. You're such a nice fella, aren't you? Hey. I have to go. <laughs> so what was the story behind that? Uh, Basically, he had a big, big cyst on his spine, which meant that he was going to have to be put down. And one of the sad uh, facts of Battersea is that a lot of the animals that come through don't come out because uh, they are, you know, rejected or given up by their owners because of the conditions. And uh, for popular television, um, that's quite, you know, people like happy endings, and so you know, you have to mix light and shade within the series. But there are quite a few dogs that you get to know, and then sadly, um, that's the end. Um, but what you're seeing there, I think, you know, it's not constructed, it's not manufactured. You know, when you've got proper emotion, just let it be real and let it play. Um, you can mess around with some of the comedy moments, but um, I think that you need those sort of moments too. Were you surprised at how successful it was? Because it, from memory, it launched in quite a tough slot. It's quite difficult to do early evening factual on ITV, usually against soaps it, or whatever. It, we were very surprised. Um, I'm always surprised when you know you get a, a great rating, which is probably good because it means that when you don't, you're not quite so devastated. Um, but yes, it was. Its first slot was up against EastEnders. Um, and one thing we did notice is it began taking quite significant numbers off EastEnders. Uh, and so, you know, obviously that was great. Um, and, th you know, the, the, the mantra always has been, if you're up against the soaps, you know, be more male skewing. But actually I think that the value, a lot of the values that are in For the Love of Dogs, as in, um, you know, Long Lost Family, are 
moments of laughter, moments of real emotion and sadness. And so in a way, a lot of the palette, in the factual sense, is quite similar to your soaps. Okay, I'm going to move on to Andy now and Educating Yorkshire. Quite a different style of programme and filmed with a fixed rig. Uh, yes, and um, just a brief history. This, this wasn't... I'm sure no one of these shows was commissioned thinking it would join, you know, get five million viewers, but this absolutely wasn't commissioned. It was, you know, the first series called Educating Essex. The commissioning editor uh, was Mark Raphael, and he really had to bang the table at Channel 4 in order to get it over the line, because there was a, uh, there was a conception that anything to do with schools just didn't rate. And uh, he, so everybody commissioned it under that understanding that it probably wouldn't rate, but it was a good thing to do, that to put a fixed rig in a school would probably give us something for a documentary audience that had never been seen before and could say something important about comprehensive education. And so that was the aim. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be a hit. And the first series kind of wasn't. It, was, it got sort of above the slot average, but it was a critically received well, and I think people liked it. It was very well made. It gave some characters like Mr. Drew and various other people and some emotional stories, and it proved that... Um, you know, as, you, as, as Liam was saying, that uh, you know the adoption story can be a long and very boring story. There have been a lot of documentaries on adoption that haven't rated well, but what Long Lost Family does brilliant is it takes out the boring bits and it sort of gives you emotional hits. And I think educating Essex and then educating Yorkshire, which followed it, did a very similar thing. It's sort of school, but it's about the boring bits. You don't have to sit through double maths. <laughs> We're going to give you the critical moments when teachers and students a combine and form a relationship and you see the amazing work that comprehensive teachers do um, with, uh, with students that are often not on the straight and narrow. Um, so Educate New Yorks came on and, and, and you know, surprised us. Uh, it did have um, what Stuart pointed out, every one of these shows needs, uh, it had promotion uh, and I've never had a hit show without it getting a marketing campaign and it had a really good marketing campaign but it also had the content to market um, you know the channel knew that was, the shows were of a certain quality and so they and a certain humour that they could that they could market um, and then uh, it did that rare thing with the series and it grew uh, over the run and became talked about and in the eighth episode we ended it with a scene which we're about to show. Uh, it was the story of a boy called Musharraf who uh, had a stutter, and a stutter that was exacerbated because his headmaster took away his prefect's jersey. And um, he couldn't, he, in the words of their master, he made him a selective mute. Uh, and the teaching staff did everything they could to try and get him through uh, an oral exam that he had to pass for his GCS in English. And, and they, they weren't getting anywhere until this bizarre moment when his English teacher, Mr. Burton, um, watched the King's speech and realised that if you put headphones on, as that character in the King's Speech did, uh, it could help. And so this is the scene where he, you know, we didn't know this was going to happen. You know, it's the, it's the wonder of filming on a rig, uh, where he just pulled Musher off in one lunchtime to a classroom and, and, and this happened. Get your tissues ready. Mm -hmm. so we'll, right, one thing, and, and it's only because I watched the King's Speech quite recently, all right? But what, one thing he does do is he makes him listen to some music. No, he has to. Yeah? Okay, that's right. Go for it. One, two, three. The moment when after many years of hard work and a long... V v uh, a long... V v uh, of... Riage... Uh, 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 it's the same moment when the trees are loose, the cliffs and fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. What? Pause, pause, pause. No, the. Carry on, carry on. You own nothing, proclaiming we never belong to you. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a good scene, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the. Um, uh, I can't honestly uh, sit here and explain why that show was successful and uh, previous shows that I have made haven't been. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know all the things that went in. I know that was a very high quality series and brilliant people made it and brilliant people were in it and every story was emotional and um, 
that uh, you know all those tick boxes that we were talking about, about showing you real life, a universal life, you know, we've all been to school, we experience those emotions, every scene you can look at it and go, I remember that feeling, or my God, I've never seen anything like that. Um, what are they saying? Why are they flashing people's boobs around on a, on a mobile phone in a maths lesson? Um, but, um, so it's got universality, I think it is extraordinary, uh, because... The way that we, you know, the fixed rig reveals a, uh, a level of intimacy that you wouldn't get if there was a, um, a production team uh, stood in a classroom or in a headmaster's office when someone's getting expelled. Um, so uh, I think it has got, you know, thirsts within it. But honestly, why did five million people come to that Yorkshire and two million come to Essex? I don't know. I think it's probably something to do with the warmth of, of the county as well as much as anything. Um, but then I probably would say that here or down there. But do you think in a way that educating Essex was a bit of a trailblazer, almost a sleeper, and that things aren't necessarily overnight sensations? Yeah, I think yeah, it's, a good, it's a good point. That definitely could be a contributing factor. I think some, some of the most rewarding successes in telly are when people have shown loyalty to something that's good and not an immediate hit, aren't they? I always think that kind of the ITV team, sort of Zion, everyone that stuck with Celebrity Juice when it was... <laughs> the first series didn't rate, but it was really good, and they kept with it, and kept... And, you know, it's like a staple of the channel. I think those those are the most rewarding television successes, aren't they? Yeah, no, so I, th I think, you know, massive credit to Channel 4 for bringing back something that, you know, I think everybody liked, but wasn't an absolute slam dunk of a hit. They brought it back because it was good, I hope. And then, and then they deservedly got a hit out of it. Now, once you're there, I guess you have relatively little control because you've got your fixed rig. But before, you're choosing the school, and after, you're editing. So what, what are you looking for in both those instances to you know, get the impact that that series has end up, ended up having? Yeah, I think the, one of the biggest production moments is obviously choosing the school and the characters and um, and the students you know there is a lot of although it doesn't look about look it there is an awful lot of production that goes into it during the rig certain things you know we've, we we, you, we only have a certain amount of mics uh, you know there are we're only recording three what we call streams at any one time so there, while we have 68 cameras in the school where we can only record three of them at any one time so uh, you know you're making editorial decisions live uh, at, at that point um, that are, are very uh, important uh, but it is true to say that it's, these are films made in the edit um, uh, completely in the edit we, we um, you know carve out what we think of, you know, dramatic storylines built on a, a dramatic structure that applies to fiction as it applies to facts. You know, it's obviously based on things that have happened, but we build it to be self-contained and have a midpoint and a and a and a, uh, a climax. And um, so, uh, the 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 editors of these shows are obviously, you know, sometimes the unsung hero. You know, the the only you know we won some awards for that show, but the the only BAFTA we won was for the editor, and I think that's quite telling um, so uh, yeah no it's, a, it's an interesting production pro process and why that's why one about a school is suddenly the, the highest rating of that genre I don't know I, I, re I really wish I, wish I did because I would be repeating it in another genre hopefully you will soon so Stuart um, you've picked Inside Death Row with Trevor MacDonald um, quite a heavy subject actually uh, it was and is, and um, I suppose I was thinking about the other day that the last time I was in Sheffield talking about anything at all was seven years ago, and I'd made a film with Louis Theroux about, ironically, a prison, uh, San Quentin. And um, I watched that film back the other day, and there wasn't a single scene that lasted longer than three minutes, and not a single interview that lasted longer than two minutes. And uh, often people say, well, you know, if you make a big hitting documentary, uh, then the quality has to suffer. And yet on uh, Inside Death Row with Trevor McDonald, the last scene in the second episode was seven minutes of an uncut interview, pretty much, just Trevor and this death row inmate talking. And that was a 9 p.m. peak time slot on ITV. And, um, and that interview was compelling. It was all the things you'd like as a documentary maker. You know, the narrative had built up. The intensity was there. And Trevor went through something in that interview. He absolutely viscerally felt what it was like to sit on the bed of a death row inmate who had done something so horrific, and we hadn't told Trevor what that person had done, um, that he couldn't contain his emotion. He was a news broadcaster that uh, for 40 years had never shown any emotion, had always told us the truth about the world we lived in and never took sides. And in that moment, he went through something. And um, 
in a way, actually, that when we made a film with Louis, he never went through anything. And, um, uh, but he, he took us into the prison in a different way. And so that idea that you can't make um, high-rating documentaries without compromising somewhere along the line uh, doesn't stand for me. The other thing often that you hear, especially when you make... Uh, documentaries with presenters, and I've made a lot of them, and at Plum that's what we specialise in, is that in some way they give you ratings and they're a blessing. And, um, and actually, I think more often than not, they're quite the opposite. They present huge problems for the director on location when you're making films that you're not completely sure about, in terms of you don't know the structure, you're going into an area that you sort of know, but you're not sure what film you'll have, and you're relying on um, a combination of chemistry and that presenter to really produce something. And, uh, and that really comes down to the director not patting myself on the back but the director's ability to understand what the truth is about that presenter that you have on your hands and there's something about Trevor which is why I think uh, Death Row did work at the audience level it worked which was that he makes things seem important that actually his core activity as a presenter is that when he tells you something, you believe it, and that if he's doing it, it really matters. And, um, and that's one thing. That still doesn't get you six million, but it is a core truth about him. And, um, and that when we were in the middle of the prison working with him, uh, he was burdened by the fact that he f he'd known all the other films that had been made about death row and in prisons before, and, um, and wondered whether what we were doing was ever really going to say anything different. And, um, and the truth is, in the end, when he got through that experience, uh, he just became who he naturally was, and he bonded with the death row inmates to the extent that when we entered the uh, prison we had, uh, and this was a gamble by ITV, by the way, we had one inmate that was willing to talk to us, and, um, and by the time we left, 12 of them were willing to talk to us in that cell block. And that was entirely down to Trevor's ability to charm them, give them a sense of well-being, and a feeling that actually what he was doing in there was actually what mattered most. That the thing that Trevor has is likability, a sense of decency, and that whoever meets him anywhere in the world always feels that. When he got a handle on that and he relaxed the film became alive, and that's why that seven-minute interview worked, because he sat in that room, and he was relaxed, and he just let it go. And that, that inmate who had never talked ever about the crime he'd committed, never confessed to it, never said he was guilty of it uh, in all the courts, never did a TV interview before, actually when Trevor asked him, you know, what, have you, what did you do to, to uh, get the death sentence, he told him directly, talked him through it second by second. And so I think what's interesting about trying to get a documentary that's not constructed, where you take a risk, where you go into a world and you think, you know what, I don't know what I'm going to get, but I do know it's nine o'clock on ITV and it's being paid for and there's a lot of money and, and hope going into this and that somehow I've got to deliver. You know that actually the truth is you have got to, with a presenter, get to what they're really about. And if you don't get there, I think somehow it doesn't work for the audience. They can see the disconnect. The other thing I would say that was quite interesting when I look back on it is that um, uh, is you make the show in the style of the presenter. So when we made Louis, I self-shot that. You know, it was handheld, um, it was very raw and ragged, it looked like we didn't know how to do a music montage, it looked like we didn't know how to make something slick, it felt very sort of right up and personal. Um, and then with Trevor, it was helicopters and beautiful steady cam shots and a feeling of size and epicness, which I think the audience expects when they turn on to what is being trowed as a big event. You have got to live up to it or they won't stay around. And, and that's why the marketing matters, because you have got to give the trailer makers those shots. And that really matters, because especially in a, sh in a short run with two episodes, um, you know, you don't have time to have a conversation over s two series or, or six episodes with the audience. They see that trailer, and they have to viscerally feel that what they're getting is a big event. And the only way the marketers can do that is if you've shot it well, powerfully, and you've got really clear moments to give them. And... Um, uh, and if you don't do that, they're in trouble, and you won't, you won't push through. So I think um, the trailer makers are crucial when you're trying to, to, to shoot films like this, that you have to have in the back of your mind, what are they going to use? And it's easy in documentary to avoid thinking like that. Sometimes, you know, I'd go out and shoot, or the teams that we work with would go out and shoot, and I'd say, what is that key shot that gets to the end of the trail or opens it or is in the middle of it? It might not even make the film. But I know that in that shot, it's got such a power that the audience will remember it and they'll get it and they'll get the story. And, um, and so um, this, uh, what we're going to show is a pre-title to the second episode. And, um, and you know, it is, it's a combination of clips and events. And you see Trevor with that death row inmate um, sort of, you know, 
being being bothered. But I think what I get from it is it does feel like it's a big film, that it feels like if ITV at 9 o'clock is doing Death Row, it's doing something that it's got something to say, that it's not going to be just run of the mill, and that you know if Trevor's doing it, he's going to do something with it. And, um, and I think it sort of demonstrates both those things. So, Drew, if you'd like to run the clip, thanks. I've never believed in the death penalty myself, but when I think about what you do, I begin to understand why people feel it should be the appropriate sentence for crimes like yours. Do you understand that? I do deserve to be executed. Bottom line, I ain't gonna candy coat it. I deserve to be executed. About an hour's drive south of Chicago in the state of Indiana, is one of America's oldest and most notorious maximum security prisons. The majority of the 1,900 inmates here are serving long sentences for unspeakable crimes. And when I came at you, I wasn't just gonna stick you an inch. I was gonna run something all the way through. Twelve are due to be executed on the orders of the state. Hi. For two weeks, I was given privileged access to this dark and forbidding world. Stealing cookies as a, a seven-year-old kid, boy, in school, turned into a 20-year-old killing a cop, landing himself on death row. It went from stealing cookies to shooting a cop. Welcome to Indiana State Prison. Comes with a slight burden, which is whatever Trevor does next. <laughs> <laughs> it better be um, as epic in some way. It did have incredible gravitas. Um, I mean, you're all great at making popular programs. Do you feel that in our business, people almost look down on popular docs? that they don't get the recognition they deserve. I think it doesn't feel, I think almost by definition, it doesn't feel like a documentary, that word, whatever that word is, yeah. but as soon as it hits those, I mean, factual television to do over five million, extraordinary yeah, I thing. I mean, most drama doesn't get over five million, remember that. Now, if you look at the weekday nine o'clock dramas, very few of them get five million, so actually it is, it is a mass audience thing. I have to say, uh, Long Lost Family just won the BAFTA for not for best documentary, it's true, best features program. So I think that's Congratulations. quite good. That's real recognition of, I think when it started, there was a certain snobbiness about it being a bit of a kind of, oh, it's a format and it's, it, it's intrusive and it's a bit, you know, dirty. But it has uh, won its stripes eventually, which we're really pleased about. So I think, I think definitely there is a view that uh, the compromises you have to make to be accessible somehow equivalent to selling your soul uh, with certain categories of documentaries makers. But then I think the flip side of that, of you're on a bus and you're hearing people discussing and debating, or not debating, but having to gossip about some of the issues in a mainstream popular factual programme. That's fantastic. That's really reaching into their lives and they're taking away something from the programme. So it's actually something to be really proud of rather than a little bit ashamed of. Do you think you do make compromises <coughs> in order to get viewers, Andy? And, and no, I wouldn't say compromises. I've never wanted to make, and I, you know, knowing Leon and people on this panel as well, I, I, I've never wanted to not to make television that nobody watches. It's not um, point. Uh, I, I want to make television that watched by loads of people, and I want them to bring the, them to stories, you know, that they were unaware of. I think, you know, the social history that's embedded in Long Lost Family about what we, the way we used to live, and that babies were taken away from families by the state and you know this support that wasn't given to mothers is and families is, is remarkable and the fact that we are aware of that now through uh, a present tense uh, documentary or features program is is, uh, is is amazing i think i hope uh, we've increased debate about the amazing work that's done in comprehensive schools you know i didn't know what went on at battersea, battersea park and i bet people 
have conversations now about the death penalty more than they did, uh, you know, for, through watching that, that program. So, you know, we don't have to be on the nose, uh, I don't think, to, to get people talking and, and, and say something, do something provocative. Has every subject got the potential to bring in five million? No. I don't think it has. I think you can make a programme as wonderful and emotional and well-crafted as any of the <coughs> clips we've seen today and not get those that audience just because it doesn't appeal to as many people and that's fine too you know um not everything can or should or or is capable of getting five million viewers but i don't think that's a problem i think if you're itv or bbc one it's probably a problem but as program makers we're just there to make to execute in the best possible way that subject and may turn it into something. I say execute, not as in on death row, but <laughs> and make the programme um, and make it in the best way possible to tell that story and, and grab people's attention. But certain things just won't um, because they're not not as a, of such broad appeal. I do, the prison thing is interesting to me because mm -hmm. that is a particularly ITV thing. Mm -hmm. If it had been on BBC One, do you think it would have got so many viewers? Well. Um it's an interesting question because I think there is some magical combination between yeah. Trevor ITV and that subject matter just sort of worked. Um, I would say that the San Quentin Louis film did five and a half million on right. BBC Two, so yeah. there's something about there prisons. Right. So, prisons. But it's not just yeah. ITV in prisons. But it's interesting. I mean, who would have thought Baking was a five million yeah. success? Me, and me. you know, so it's it's yeah. But I'd like. I think Death would be one of the hard. Yeah. I, you know, it's almost like a challenge. Any director that could get five million to a story about death would be. Would be something. Well, who would have mm. thought gypsies would be mm. five million? I mean, when you commissioned. But there's something. There's, there's, that's the Daily Mail thing, isn't it? In a way, there are certain subjects what? that just where we sort of feel is familiar but exotic as well. But it's sort no. of in that conscious. But until then, there hadn't been a show that made you think that gypsies would rate. Whereas, no. mm. you know, it tends to be if you look at the list, yeah. it's royals, mm. it's. Um, animals, it's prisons, mm. it's, you know. But if you look at the boxes that we're, we're trying to establish in, in terms of like it, it being extraordinary, that was truly extraordinary. Mm. The, the tape that Jez brought in uh, and showed me was pretty much the trail that went out. Mm. It, was, it, was, it, was, it was such an easy commission mm. to go that I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, I wonder what they're like. You but know, it's not it's so of, other, is it? Because we all sort of think we know. We've all, we've we've all, all got, got an opinion. Yeah, we've all been to a wedding. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we sort of got an idea about... I think gypsies, you'd probably file under those extraordinary people that are also... I'm not saying they're, all, <laughs> they're in prison, but it's sort of... That's, it's another worldly place that we probably are not going to get invited into. Yeah. You know, and what a, what a world... It's it was clever, though, because it, it, it signified a specific part of their life that allowed the audience access. Yeah. Gypsies wouldn't, but wed, putting it as a wedding gave you a, a particularly good in, and then you could go anywhere. And that really made it accessible in a way that BBC Three series on gypsies never did. Mm. Yeah. But in, again, just marketing, mm. a really easy thing to market. Those trails ran for uh, three weeks, and mm. everybody was talking about them. It was like, mm. did you see that woman get <laughs> stuck in mm. the Jordan carriage with her dress? <laughs> Every, you know, and you knew it was. You, well, you knew it was going to get watched. But I thought two million. You know, mm. not. What was the first one? Four point six or something. Four point five. Yeah. And I, I mean, and that brings me on to another question. Do you know, when you're sitting there in the edit, do you kind of know, do you have a feeling that it's going to burst through in the ratings? You, you know when, you've, when you're seeing something you've never quite seen before and it's, it is exceptional, whether it will then translate is slightly in the lap of the gods and the broadcasters and the schedule and all those things that you can't control and the title, mm. you can get it wrong and people just don't go to it. I'm intrigued actually by who do you think you are because that's essentially the same format week after week, always really well made. We're making well our 100th made. episode at the moment. Yeah, so always really well made, interesting mm. characters, but some rate much more highly than others. And going back through um, the list, the two that I found that had rated the most highly were Nigel Havers and J.K. Rowling. Mm. Well, I think um, J.K. Rowling was a series launch, so the series launch, I mean, we always put the strongest episode and the biggest name at the, at the front, and, and that was a series launch. With Nigel Havers, I just think, 
I mean, it's a combination of what's on the other side, but also the BBC One audience love Nigel Havers. So an, the, well, the, the who do you think you are audience, and it's awful, you can't kind of define them too tightly, but there is something about the sort of people who love the show that will love Nigel Havers, and it's not necessarily even the BBC One audience, but it is the who do you think you are audience, adore Nigel Havers, and, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, there are others like that that slightly would surprise you. I mean, not of you, three of you actually do entertainment as well. Do you think it's harder to get rating success with factual than entertainment? Is there a genre bias? I don't know. Uh, I don't no, know. I don't. I, I think it is. I, don't okay. think, I think they're equally, equally hard and, and equally elusive. unexplainable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, an entertainment flop certainly worse, I yeah, think, that's than the thing. I think entertainment flops are uh, more visible and... Uh, it's yeah. the perception that it should rate with entertainment, yeah. isn't it? If you don't rate with entertainment, it's like, well, what are you there for? And, you know, whereas in factual programmes, you can wag your finger yeah, and say, yes, but did you see it? We got access to a world no one had seen before, <laughs> so it was fine. It was very important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you've each also bought clips of shows that didn't get five million, but you feel... Should have done, could have done, yeah. or whatever. So, Leanne, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, very quickly. So this is... I, I, I wanted it to be in stark contrast to Long Lost Family. Um, uh, but, and this is a show that I wonder if it hadn't started on BBC Three and now it's actually repeated, I think, uh, at 10.35 on BBC One. And I'm told by its makers, aggregates about 3 million viewers, although I think it, it, its first rating was under a million. But I wonder, a show like this at 9 o'clock, or certainly 8 o'clock, on ITV could potentially become, grow into a big hit. And it's the call centre, which is um, a BBC documentary series yeah. about a call centre. And it's a very small world, but what it does have at the heart of it is one character who's Nev, who runs the place, who is... I mean, it's... If Long Lost Family is a soap opera, or actually I like to think more of a kind of, you know, nine o'clock drama, then this is a sitcom. <laughs> and he's a fantastic, warm, funny, outrageous character. You can just watch and watch and watch. And we all go to work every day. And a lot of people now, I don't know how many million of us work in a situation like that. So you sort of wonder whether that could be a mainstream hit on ITV. So um, do you want to roll the clip? Or even BBC One, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Give him yeah. a BBC With over half of his sales ages under 25, Nev has developed a unique approach to keeping his young workforce on their toes. Sums up my management style. Get out of my office! The yawn at the back! Get down! <laughs> that was the clip that the BBC supplied me. But anyway, <laughs> um, so that's that. Fact. I mean, in a way, he sort of does everything that a boss shouldn't do, but gets away with it because he is such a warm individual, whether he's trying to help women who work for them patch up their love lives or find them boyfriends yeah. or, you know, I mean, he crosses so many boundaries and yet it's completely... Are you, are you saying that sh what could have got five million if it was nine o'clock and ITV? Potentially, or, yeah. or eight o'clock. I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I just think... I think the combination of comedy and an incredibly relatable yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why precinct. Why do you not end it? I just... Uh, I don't think it... I think it feels like the Armstrongs, one of those curious eggs that is kind of richly enjoyed by a section of the audience, but not a kind of... I, mm, I think it's much warmer than that. Those, those are quite cold and arch, and that thing you were saying about you, 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 know, you go into it at, at their level, it's not kind of... Mm. It's much warmer and, and friendlier than that, so... OK, Alex, let's have thought. a look. Uh, Sorry, I'm having to race through a little bit. Now, in a way, a in a way just for me... I was me, going to say educating Yorkshire, actually. <laughs> um, I realise you're on the panel. <laughs> uh, we talked earlier, we mentioned very, very briefly earlier subject matter. And um, for me, this is a documentary that... Um, the subject matter is why it got 1.6 million viewers. But in terms of approach, it very much had the values and approach, I think, of a much, much bigger program. In the, I think that the very big programs are often non-judgmental, where the audience feel like they're participants making up their own mind, making up their own opinions, and really engaging with characters as real people. Um, and it's directed by two brilliant people, I think, Sarah Hardy and Blue Ryan. 
and it's uh, the clip at the end of a programme called The Unspeakable Crime Rape, um, and it's uh, a woman called Juliet who originally isn't the most sympathetic of rape victims because she was catatonically drunk when raped. Um, so in a Daily Mail sense, you would have condemned her from the start, but as you see from the clip at the end, by the end, you would definitely in a very different position. The shoes Juliet was wearing on New Year's Eve were taken during the investigation. Now she can get them back. What was weird was the reaction I got um, from the police when I said, well, I want them back. And I said, well, they're my beautiful, lovely, expensive shoes, and my shoes didn't rape me. I want them back. One shoe in each bag? One shoe in each bag, that's the way get stored. Is it? Oh, OK. <laughs> it's got my shoes. <laughs> Really weird feeling. Really weird. Fat. What we're trying to do is prevent long term problems developing. Oh, yeah. Now I'm happy. Now I'm a happy girl. <laughs> You'd have thought. <laughs> um, and Andy, I think your clip. Uh, it's Inside Clarities. Inside Clarities, which did very well on BBC Two uh, and has transferred into one of those programmes that when you go in to see commissioners or controllers, they say, what's our Inside Clarities? And I just think that's uh, a mark of success. And I love the story of why uh, Jane Triez, who made it, is one of my favourite directors, and she got married at Claridge's. And to get access to Claridge's, it was a long process. And she said, told me the story that they, at the critical point, said, well, how can we trust you? And she said, well, I trusted you with my wedding so you can trust me with a series <laughs> and, uh, and that's how she got and, uh, but it was a, it was a really good series about um the, the, she she also says it's a series about detail it's like we all the universality is that of course we're interested in what happens between posh places and, and places we might never go but the the um, but we're also all all very ordered and things like that but these people are ordered on an extraordinary level and this clip is just when the i think it's the emperor of japan that is about to arrive and thomas who's the lead character has got everyone lined up and uh, very ordered So the idea was that we obviously meet him outside of the main door, them, it's um, obviously both of them, and then I walk them in and right now the plan is to use the lift, okay? And if they come out of the lift, I would suggest that we stand on top of the staircase, but if they don't use the lift, that we maybe line up here on the stairs. Because how many people do we also have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So if they take the lift, we are too many people. Can we do one per step or is it too close? But then you can't bow. Then we need to half the group. Do we want to do it boy, girl, boy, girl or? Should be height, okay. So if Oliver, then a little gap, Martin, Sally, Carl. The plan has to be very, very straightforward. Yeah, let's hope he uses the staircase. If he doesn't, the first eight people come. <laughs> so how much does the channel affect, you know, your chances of getting five million? Is it more difficult on BBC Two and Channel Four? I wonder if the channel is becoming less important, but the schedule is always important, but whether the channel is becoming less important because people are less defined. They, they, you know, you don't get a Channel 4 person quite as much as you used to because we're so, um, uh, what's the word, promiscuous with our viewing. You know, we, we'll watch anything on any channel now, won't we? And um, So uh, I, I, I would warrant that that got, would get a higher... At 9 o'clock on BBC One or ICV, perhaps it would get more, but... You know, it, it was probably a sh helped by the scheduling, but also our, our natural fascination for um, uh, 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 something we'd heard of, but probably wouldn't go to. I think. So, Stuart, you've got a clip from Channel Four, mm, the plane crash. Why did you choose this one? I think because whenever you go, as my um, 
uh, producer head on, whenever you pitch to commissioners of all the channels, the one thing you quite of, often hear back is that um, they're looking for the very big um, factual idea that rises above everything else. And this is such an extraordinary um, film. You know, it was about um, a real jetliner crashing. It crashed a real jetliner dragonfly. And, um, and I don't think you see that every day on television. That felt like a big, sexy, very relatable idea. And, um, and the, actually the packaging of it was very Channel 4, actually, in a way. You kind of fitted exactly what you would expect Channel 4 to do with it in, in lots of ways. But if you put it onto BBC One or you'd put it onto ITV uh, One, had presenters that felt familiar faces, made it feel as live, um, I suspect that although it did very well on Channel 4, it would have done, uh, it probably would have climbed to 5 million. And um, it felt just like a big idea that you couldn't quite believe um, television pulled off and I know the pain the producers went through pulling it off uh, so that I think this is the trailer or a, a trailer clip of, of the show These scientists and investigators have spent their lives studying something they've never actually seen until now. We crash cars all the time. We don't do that with planes just to see if we could make them safer or not. We attempt to discover exactly what happens when a passenger aircraft hits the ground. What are our chances of survival? Where should we sit? Should we brace? This is a unique experience to see the aircraft beforehand and watch it crash. An epic and groundbreaking experiment for you years in the making. <laughs> so I'm going to throw the um, uh, panel open to questions now. Um, after the questions, we have drinks, but they're only there, so it's not far to go. Um, paid for by ITV, so we'll thank them, um, I'm sure. But um, anybody got any questions? They want a drink. They will want a drink. Mm. Yes? Uh, I've often speculated about what programs I made they will get, and I've come to the conclusion a lot of it, or a small part of it at least, is the title. Would you like to take the microphone? Sorry. Oh, just... I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, do you think the title, in that it, it tells the audience exactly what they are going to see, and if they're interested, they'll tune in. What would you say would be the importance of how it's titled? I think, I think it's very, it can be very important. Um, but finding the right title is the hardest thing. It's harder mm. than making the show sometimes, and sometimes you never do. Um, and we actually we were talking about this before, weren't we? But um, who do you think you are? Which, as we were saying, is now we're making our hundredth episode for the BBC, and we make it uh, in America as well, and in various other places around the world. It is made. Um, it was originally in development called Back to My Roots. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly say, I think it wouldn't have got mm -hmm. a second series if it had been, if, if it had stayed with that title, because it just sounds, well, literally kind of earthy and worthy and a bit mm. dull, doesn't it? And Who Do You Think You Are was a very, very clever title. I can't remember who came up with it, but it was mm. very I'd, I'd second that. I mean, mm. uh, we actually did some market research, and the market research came back saying that we should call uh, Paul O'Grady for Love of Dogs Battersea Dogs. And... I, you know, I don't think that has any warmth. It just tells you about the place. It's very factual and doesn't give you, and actually makes you think it's about the place rather than actually the love of the animals within the place. And so, luckily, everyone ignored the market research in that case. Mm. But had we been called that, I think people looking in the EPG would have thought, I'll go elsewhere. Should someone sometimes one be careful not to choose a sort of uh, imaginative? Uh, title that sounds good, that you feel good about having made up, but the audience mm. is quizzical. Mm. What is this program about? It never well, helps if you have to explain the title to somebody. You know, yeah, they, should, they should get a sense of what the show is immediately. And whoever they are, a stranger should get it. Otherwise, it's, it's a barrier to your viewing pleasure, I think. But at the same time, mm. if it can capture the tone as well, That's it's what a really it has good to thing. Because who do you think you are is a clever title because it yeah. immediately, what the show does is reduce celebrities to the level of all of us because it says you just come from or any sort of back, you know, you don't know what your ancestors did, but chances are they were the same as my ancestors. And it, it you know, it's a, a challenge to them, isn't it? So it's sort of there in the title. It's a clever, t it's not just a Ron Seal title or whatever, mm. you know. Uh, uh, straightforward, mm. this is it. I think Educating Yorkshire is quite a boring title. <laughs> yeah, we struggled for that one. It was yeah. called Classmates, that was the working title. Yeah. And then we wanted to call it The School. 
uh, and yeah. then uh, it, it's a follow-on from Educating Essex, which was sort of a play on, I don't know. I, I, I educating Rita. I never let, no, no, it was a play on Educating Rita, but also a play on... Uh, Only Way is Essex. Yeah, Essex. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so of course, a bit of a yeah. mash-up. And so yeah. we kept, then we figured we had a brand and we wanted people to associate it. So, yeah. we, so we go, well, you know, worked. the next one mm. is set in London and we're still struggling on what to call it. For the same Battersea reason, actually, because I think people outside London don't massively like London. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're right. Yeah. Um, probably got time for one more question. I'm getting a flashing red light here, which I'm ignoring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, I think every head of development has got now the cutting edges that have rated the best through the through the years. Um, but my boss the other day decided to sit us down and tell us about all the films that he'd ever commissioned that had totally bombed and explain why, which was actually really helpful. So I just wanted to ask the panel if they'd had films that they thought this is going to be amazing and then the yeah. overnights come in it <laughs> <laughs> we all try and forget those <laughs> but uh, Stuart I had a whole series that bombed once and um, it was um, uh, it was a series about life, it was access to a lot of 1970s entertainers, Louis Thru was the exec producer, it was really funny it was clever, it felt exactly BBC2 um, it was scheduled in a challenging way and um, for the first two episodes, and it never survived after that. And so, I, and it's hard to let go as a program maker. You know it was good, and um, you never quite get over it. And um, and um, as you can tell, and um, but that's okay. It's just the nature of television. So yes, it's you see the figure and you feel that achy, horrible feeling at 9 a.m. the following morning, you know, and it happens for six weeks. <laughs> Mm. We were talking about the Beckham doc that went out mm. on Monday, which I think probably consolidated will get five million. But Stuart, you made one you were yeah, saying. Well, actually, weirdly enough, Peter Salmon was somewhere in the audience here who commissioned that when he was controller of BBC One. And um, it rated 10.35 at night. It's one of the first things I ever made, I think, in 1998. Seven million people at 10.35. And by 11.20, they were still watching. And um, it was extraordinary. I can't imagine anything getting that kind of figure again. And um, uh, it, w it was sort of it just shows how television and audiences have sort of changed. That there was that sort of amount of people willing to watch a film at twenty past eleven. That was basically a documentary, and he wasn't even that famous by that stage. So yeah, weird thing. Okay, so many thanks to the panel, to Andy and Stuart and Alex and Leanne. I think they've been incredibly open about uh, the secrets of their success and uh, hopefully you can all take something away from that. The ITV team, the factual team are hanging around to have drinks with you so you can get to know them or have a chat with them. And uh, the drinks are just at the other end of the hall. And thanks very much to our wonderful audience. Thank you.